Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm doing another Kahoot, but it's a little bit different. This Kahoot is for the NP students, my students who are already registered nurses. They're trying to get that master's. They want to be a nurse practitioner. If you're currently in the program or you've graduated and you're studying for your boards, this is a great Kahoot for you. Now, this is going to be part one of a part two, maybe even three part series of uh, the respiratory system because um, this video is going to cover a lot of, you know, respiratory, but I haven't even touched on the meds like I need to. So the meds are going to be another Kahoot by itself. So I encourage you, um, if you want to be a nurse practitioner, watch this video and uh, share it with someone else that you know that is in the program or wants to be in the program. It's great information that you will see well, I can't say, well, I don't write the test guys, but it's very likely, right? That you'll see it on your boards. If you're taking ANCC or AANP, this is um, a vital information for both. As always, I'm going to ask you to please like this video, support me, support this channel by liking this video, subscribing to my channel if you haven't done so already. And don't forget, I have audio lessons available on my website and you can also book for a review NGN Next Generation NCLEX right there on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Okay, guys, let's get started. Respiratory for the NP part one. When a patient presents to your office complaining of a cough, what should be your first question? Is it productive? How often are you coughing? How long have you been coughing? Or do you feel a tickle in your throat? What do you guys think the answer is? Choose your answer. Very good. So most of you guys chose the correct answer. How long have you been coughing? That needs to be the first question that you ask. Now, obviously, guys, you guys can you guys are going to be following up with a lot more questions. But the first thing you're going to ask is how long you've been coughing, because um, that tells you what your different differential diagnoses are going to look like, right? And we're going to get um, into the time frame, but again, that time frame is going to let you know what your differential diagnoses are going to be looking like. Very good. If the patient reports that the cough started less than three weeks ago, what would be your differential diagnosis? Select all that applies. Guys, don't forget how to treat select all that applies. You treat them as true or false. So you ask them, when did the cough start it? And they say that it was less than three weeks ago. What's going to be part of your differential diagnosis? GERD, acute bronchitis, pneumonia, asthma exacerbation, heart failure, COPD exacerbation. Which ones are you going to choose? Again, this is a select all that apply. Okay, time's up. Let's talk about this. So look at GERD. You are not going to choose GERD. You're not even, you're not going to be thinking GERD if that cough has been less than three weeks, because with GERD, we expect the cough to be much longer, much more chronic, right? No, but acute, remember acute means right away, acute bronchitis. Absolutely. That's a possibility. That's going to be part of your differential diagnosis. Pneumonia. Absolutely. That's going to be part of your differential diagnosis. Um, well, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, asthma exacerbation. Absolutely. Patients already had asthma. This is a chronic condition, but an exacerbation is what? Acute. So you seeing this less than three weeks ago, it makes sense. Heart failure. No. Heart failure. This is a chronic condition. So a patient has heart, um, heart failure. It's progressive. They develop a cough, but we're not going to see this right away like this. So false. And then look at COPD exacerbation. True. Again, COPD, guys, this is a chronic condition, but the exacerbation, that's acute. That's right away. So that's why the time frame makes such a big difference. Now, before I move on to the next screen, I want to say something else to you guys. You see pneumonia. So let's say you have your differential diagnoses. And like I said, pneumonia will be one of them. But then as you're asking questions and you're getting more information, if that patient's not presenting with a fever, how likely do you think that patient's going to have pneumonia, right? You really don't see fever with pneumonia 
acute bronchitis, asthma exacerbation, you really don't see that generalized symptom. So, so even after you have your differential diagnoses, you still have to ask more questions that are specific to the disease process to really narrow down what your primary, even your secondary diagnosis for that patient's going to be. Oh, yo, yo, you're in the lead. Martina, you're second. Guys, I promise you, I'm not giving them the answers. They're doing this on their own. Those are my babies, so I'm so proud of you guys. If the patient reports that the cough started, started more than three weeks ago, then what would your differential diagnosis be? Select all that apply. Lung cancer, chronic bronchitis, GERD, or asthma? I forgot this was a question because I would not have given you guys the answer. I literally just gave you guys the answer to this. So what do you think? If the cough was more than three weeks ago, what would be your differential diagnosis? Diagnoses, I should say. Lung cancer. Yeah, let me tell you something. When the patient presents with a long-term chronic cough and they're like, you know, I've had this for so long and I just can't get rid of it. <gasps> That needs to be part of one of your differential diagnoses. And then you're going to look at other things like, you know, is the patient losing weight? Are they coughing up uh, blood? Things like that. But absolutely, that's going to be one of your differential diagnoses. Chronic bronchitis. Notice I put that word chronic in front of bronchitis. More than three weeks, long-term, ongoing? Absolutely. GERD. Yes, I already explained to you before. GERD, we see, um, and let me explain to you what happens with the GERD. So the patient will have reflux. And after a while of them having that reflux, guess what? They start to produce a cough because that, that uh, hydrochloric acid that's been burning the esophagus for all this time, now they have a cough, right? And of course, asthma. Notice that we're talking about the cough that lasted for more than three weeks. It doesn't say asthma exacerbation. It says asthma. And guys, this makes such a big difference. When you are testing, please read very carefully and pay attention to the wording because it makes such a big difference. You should be suspicious of which drug class if a patient starts um, complaining of a cough within one to two weeks of administration. So they took this medication and within one to two weeks of taking this medication, what drug are you going to be suspicious of if they start coughing? A beta blocker, a calcium channel blocker, an ACE inhibitor, or a vasodilator? What do you guys say? An ACE inhibitor. You know those medications that end in pril, right? Remember I taught you how to remember those ACE inhibitors? Um, April, who you know I was in the nursing program with, and she always used to get A's, and I always used to get A's, and we used to always be in competition. Well, I would remember April always ACE her exams. Those medications that end in pril, those ACE inhibitors, they sometimes give coughs, especially to um, highly melanated people, Blacks, African-Americans. So you're going to be suspicious of an ACE inhibitor, okay? Yo, yo, you're on fire. If the chest x-ray shows consolidation or you hear dullness upon percussion of the lungs or breath sounds have been decreased, what are you going to suspect? Bronchitis, pneumonia, emphysema, or lung cancer? What do you guys say? Pneumonia. Very good. So let's take a look, guys. Let's say you didn't know any of the other symptoms. You you didn't remember dullness of percussion or decreased lung sound, something else I didn't add in there that you need to know, or even hearing crackles, right? That lets you know there's fluid in the lung. Is there ever supposed to be fluid in the lung? Absolutely not. You should still be suspecting that infection of the lung, which is pneumonia because of what? Consolidation. When you see consolidation, or you see infiltrates on that chest x-ray, the first thing that needs to be going through your mind needs to be pneumonia, okay? All right, the select all that applies. When, um, what patient teaching should you provide for the prevention of acute bronchitis? Smoking cessation, avoid known respiratory irritants, treat underlying conditions such as asthma or GERD, get the annual flu shot, take cough suppressant for nighttime relief, 
take antibiotics if bacterial? What do you guys say? What patient teaching should you provide for the prevention of acute bronchitis? Nobody's answering, guys. I have like a lot of people in the room and only five people are answering. Really? So let's talk about this. Smoking cessation, absolutely. You want to pre prevent acute bronchitis? Teach them to stop smoking because smoking is one of those risk factors. Avoid known respiratory irritants such as smoke. That is a respiratory irritant. <clears throat> Excuse me. That will help to prevent acute bronchitis. Treat underlying conditions such as GERD. And put that patient on an asthma medication plan to treat um, asthma or the GERD that they have. That's going to help prevent um, acute bronchitis. Yep. Teach them to get their flu shot every flu season. That will help prevent bronchitis. But look at this one. Seven of you guys chose take cough suppressant for night nighttime relief. Let me tell you something. Even if an answer choice is beautiful, because look at this answer choice, you're teaching them to take cough suppressants for um, nighttime relief. That is a fine teaching to teach a patient who's coughing, who already has bronchitis. But look at what my question's asking for. It says prevention. Patient doesn't have bronchitis yet. We're trying to prevent them from having bronchitis. We're trying to prevent them from that excessive cough. You have to read carefully. Look at the other wrong choice. Take antibiotics if it's, bacteri if it's bacterial. Well, that's great advice for the patient that already has acute bronchitis and the underlying nature is of uh, bacterial nature. By the way, guys, bronchitis is usually viral. And that's why it's self-limiting, right? It's very short, right? But if it's of a bacterial nature, of course, you're going to teach a patient to take the antibiotics. But again, the question is talking about prevention. You guys have to read very carefully because you can know this information, but just reading too quickly and you'll get the answer incorrect. What is the mainstay treatment for all categories of persistent asthma? Xanthines, leukotriene antagonists, anticholinergics or inhaled corticosteroids. What do you guys say? I want everyone participating. There's more than pe four people in this room. Let's keep going. I want to see more answers. Come on, guys. Very good. Inhaled corticosteroids. So you have a patient and look at this word persistent. That means we've gone up every level and the patient's still having these symptoms. What is the mainstay? What do we know for sure? If they don't get anything else, they're going to get this and it's going to be your inhaled uh, cortical steroids. And we'll talk about that more when I do the Kahoot on these medications. And guys, you need to know these medications. I promise you, they're going to ask about it and you need to know them in depth. But uh, again, that mainstay is going to be your inhaled cortical steroids. Okay, yo yo still in the lead. Martina second. Carly, I see your third. What is the most common symptom of bronchitis? Is it fever, sore throat, cough, or a headache? And everyone should get this right because I accidentally gave you the answer in another teaching I was just doing, like two slides before. What do you guys think? The most common symptom of bronchitis. Very good. Cough. Absolutely. Matter of fact, if the patient presents with a cough, but they have a fever, sore throat, headache, um, you're going to have some other differential diagnoses. You're not even going to be really thinking bronchitis. Which is the most common type of pneumonia? And it produces a rust colored sputum. Very important. What's the most common type of pneumonia? And this most common type of pneumonia produces rust-colored sputum. Is it pneumococcal, mycobacterium, mycoplasma, or uh, chlamydophila? What do you guys say? Pneumococcal, also known as strep. That's your strep pneumonia. And that's the most common that we see, okay? And this is of a bacterial nature. True or false? The Prevnar PV7, this is the pneumonia vaccine for children. True or false? Mm 
my niece and yo-yo over here trying to cheat guys asking me for the answer i'm not giving you guys the answer true very good yes that is the pneumonia vaccine for children Which diagnosis should be considered in any patient that's older than 40 years old, they have a chronic cough, sputum production, dyspnea, and they have a history of smoking? Is it going to be asthma, COPD, pneumonia, or bronchitis? What do you guys say? Very good. Most of you guys chose COPD. And here's how you should have kind of ruled it out, guys. The fact that this patient, um, they're older than 40 years old. They have a chronic cough. So this cough has been going on for a while. Sputum production, difficulty breathing, history of smoking. Well, I'm not seeing anything of, about a fever that would make me think that there's some pneumonia going on. And with asthma, um, I'm losing my sense. Oh, with asthma, we see the patients with asthma. It's not like when they get older or 40 years old that we're suddenly seeing this, but we are seeing that with COPD. We see as you get older and you've been smoking or you've been um, exposed to irritants of the lungs or the respiratory tract, your risk for COPD increases. So the key that would have made me kind of differentiate and figure out, okay, I know for sure I'd be between asthma and COPD and I can't figure out which, but because I see more than 40 years old, I'm going with the COPD and absolutely COPD. Now, before I move on to the next screen, a couple of other things that you guys need to know for your test, whether you're testing for a, um, ANCC or AANP, um, when it comes to COPD, COPD, you have bronchitis and emphysema. That's part of COPD. Remember, COPD is irreversible. You can treat it, but you can't reverse it. That's number one. And it's progressive. As time goes on, it's going to get worse, right? But asthma, asthma is not part of COPD. Many students make that mistake. It is not part of COPD. And guess what? Asthma overall, pretty much, it is reversible. That patient's having an asthma attack and you give them a SABA, you give them a short acting um, beta agonist and we reverse the issue. So that's a big difference. And you guys are expected to know that for testing purposes. Yo-Yo and Martina, you guys still in the lead. Okay. Which diagnostic test confirms COPD? Chest x-rays, pulmonary function test, chest CTs, or spirometry? Did you guys look at the answers while I was gone or something? How do you guys know all these answers? Mm. What do you guys say? What's your answer? Pulmonary function test. Yep. It's with a pulmonary function test that we can confirm um, COPD. Oh, Carly, I see you creeping up on yo-yo. What are the symptoms or clinical manifestations for COPD? Select all that apply. Again, how are we going to treat select all that apply? We're going to treat it as true or false. History of smoking, decreased breath sounds, wheezing, barrel chest, use of the tripod positions, crackles in the lung bases. What do you guys say? All of them, every single one of them. You're going to see um, that history of smoking that increases the risk for COPD significantly. Decreased breath sounds. Why? Because you have hyperinflammation. In, 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 I can't speak. Hyperinflation of the airways. That um, CO2 is being trapped. It's not getting out. You're going to have decreased breath sounds. You're going to have wheezing because constriction of the airways. Barrel chest. Again, all of that CO2 is staying within the lungs. It's not. Um, um, the patient's not breathing it out, and that's what keeps that patient in that uh, acidic state. Use of tripod position, yes. That use of tripod position helps to alleviate, um, helps them to breathe better. 
Why? Because it helps the lungs to expand just a little bit more, helps that diaphragm to come down just a little bit more so that the lungs can expand and crackles in the lung basis. Are we ever supposed to hear crackles? Absolutely not. But in those COPD, COPD patients, it's uh, very common that we do hear it, all of them. True or false? FEV1, FVC ratio of less than 70% confirms the diagnosis of COPD in the symptomatic patient. Is this true or is it false? Very good. It's true. And let me show you guys something. This is our key word, symptomatic. In order for um, them to have this diagnosis, not only does it have to be less than 70%, they need to be symptomatic. They need to be exhibiting those signs and symptoms and clinical manifestations that we've already discussed. Oh, yo, yo, your spot's gotten taken. A deficiency in what should cause a suspicion for COPD? Pulse ox, ABGs, respirations, or alpha-1 antitrypsin. If the patient doesn't have enough of what, what are you going to suspect COPD for? Wow, only two of you guys chose alpha-1 antitrypsin. Well, that's the correct answer. If they don't have enough of that, you should be thinking of COPD. But just Guys, using our common sense, let's think about it. How are you going to have a deficiency of pulse ox? Your, your pulse ox may be low. You know, normal is 95 to 100. Preferably, we want it 98 to 100. It could be low, but how are you going to have deficiency of a pulse ox? How are you going to have a deficiency of ABGs? You know, your CO2 may be low. Your oxygen may be low, your bicarb may be low, but how are you going to have a deficiency? And same thing with respirations. Even if you didn't know what the answer was, guys, it sh still should have led you to your alpha-1 antitrypsin. And by the way, make sure that you guys know this marker. You'll most likely see it again. Which drug class should never be prescribed to patients with asthma or COPD? Is it your short-acting beta agonist? Is it your long-acting beta agonist? Is it your beta blockers? Or is it your anticholinergics? Which drug class do you never give uh, to patients with respiratory conditions such as asthma or COPD? Beta blockers. Beta blockers. And I'm going to go more into deep detail on this uh, probably on the second video, but you know how you have your, uh, um, your one and your two. And the way you remember this, guys, you have one heart and two lungs. So yeah, the beta blocker acts on your one, your heart, it decreases the heart rate, it can decrease the blood pressure, but it messes with your two, your lungs. Patient with asthma or COPD, you need, do you think that they need for their respirations to be decreased for anything to be messing with those lungs? Absolutely not. So you are not going to give a beta blocker blocker to any patient that has a respiratory condition such as asthma or COPD. Oh, yo, yo, you're back to first place. I see you, Nicole. Which drug is a LABA and should not be given during an acute asthmatic episode? Salmeterol, albuterol, atenolol, or at this point, I give up. Professor D, I don't know what, what, what I'm even doing here. What do you guys say? Well, very good. Most of you guys chose the correct answer, salmeterol. So salmeterol is a long-acting beta agonist. So if a patient's having an acute attack, they cannot breathe. Their airway's closing up on them. You better not give them a labo because by the time that labo starts working, they're going to be under uh, six feet under the ground. You have to give them a SABA, a short-acting beta agonist, right? And so salmeterol, that is an example of a labo. Albuterol, that is an example of a SABA. That is our short-acting beta agonist. That's what you're going to give the patient if they're in an acute asthmatic crisis. Atenolol, what's that? That's a beta blocker. And then <laughs> two people chose, I give up. Don't give up, guys. There's only one more question left. Don't give up.
One more question. Asthma should be suspected if the patient exhibits which symptoms or clinical manifestations? Select all that applies. This is a select all that apply, guys. Fever, cough, wheezing, shortness of breath, chest tightness, headache. When are you going to suspect asthma? What clinical manifestations um, would you see to make you think, okay, I think I'm going to give the diagnosis of asthma to this patient? This is a select all that applies. All right. So two people chose fever, but I don't know why they would choose fever because at the very first slide, I explained to you, I said, when it comes to asthma, we don't expect that patient to exhibit a fever because remember, asthma is hyperconstriction of the airways. It has nothing to do with infectious process. We don't expect that patient to have a fever, but a cough, absolutely. With hyperconstriction of the airways, um, we may see cough, we may see wheezing, Shortness of breath, yeah, they can't breathe. Chest tightness, absolutely. Headache, no, you don't expect to see a headache or a fever. Okay, let's see who won this Kahoot, third place. Yo, yo, I'm so proud of you. Good girl, good girl, honey. Nicole, and first place. Congratulations, Nicole. Carly, Carly, congratulations. Oh my gosh, you guys, oh, runner up. My baby, Martina and Missy, number five. You guys did a great job and I promise I'm going to keep them coming, more to come. Please guys, share this video with anybody you know that's in the program to be a nurse practitioner or they would like to be a nurse practitioner. They wanna learn about these disease processes and the medications. Guys, please don't forget to like this video, subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. And also on my website, Nexus Nursing Institute, you can book for an NCLEX review for RNPN, and you can also get yourself an audio lesson, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Thank you so much for watching, guys, and you guys catch me on the next video.